This is a University of Otago podcast. So now it's over to Kelly Fleming and Kelly really really a big welcome to you coming all the way down from Wellington to do this presentation and Kelly's going to talk about again an idea an idea that has been talked about for a long time but Kelly actually got up and did something about <laughs> it recently and um, she's pushing it forward so good on you Kelly already <laughs> but um, over to you to tell us more about it yeah thanks Sarah um, yeah that was kind of gonna be my caveat too this is not gonna be rocket science um, but I think I'm just gonna share with you, again, kind of the way Wing was saying, as sort of a dialogue about uh, what we did, um, my thought process behind what we did, and, um, and then if we have plenty of time at the end, um, I actually have um, the sort of logins and stuff, so you can actually have a play, and also I can give you that information so you can go off and be at your desk and play with it. So, um, right, so I'm Kelly Fleming, I'm the pro program manager for the Occupation and Aviation Medicine Unit. So that is a fully postgraduate um, pro, um, we offer only postgraduate papers in the fields of occupational medicine, aviation medicine, and aeromedical retrieval and transport. So our students, like most distance students, are full-time employed, um, in our case, medical professionals who are doing sort of upskilling um, in, these, in those three specialties. Um, <clears throat> We have nine papers um, that we nine papers we teach on a um, year yearly, so we have 18 papers at cycle. Um, 80 to 100 students, um, and then I would say our point of difference, and I think each of the distance programs has a point of difference, um, is that we are fully distance. There's no required face-to-face -face time. There's no residential program, um, and so that has its own challenges, because I fully agree that some amount of face-to-face -face time is really useful. Um, and we also have a 60-40 split when it comes to domestic and international students. So those numbers, about 7% international students in the distance world, a large percentage of that 7% are in our program. And that's another reason why we don't do a, a, a required face-to-face, -face, because we can offer it as a fully distance for people that are living all over the world. Um, yeah, so the other thing, so, so how do I fit into that? I'm not a medical anything. Um, I actually come from the intercultural relations program, uh, so sort of inter, interdisciplinary. Rob, oh, Rob Griffiths is the director of this um, unit, and so um, he usually calls me an educationalist. So I'm not, sh I'm sure I'm not, but, um, but that's sort of, I'm sort of thinking about um, the, our program we're also, <laughs> I'm all over the place. We're also turning 30 next year. So we've been around for a while. We've been teaching from a distance for a while. We've been teaching this content for a while. And my, I, was, I kind of was brought in to kind of think about um, the way we teach and how well we're teaching and our faculty development from a sort of continuous improvement model. So I was you know, going to conferences, thinking about how we offer things and thinking about where the big, where the big problems are, or the limitations are for distance learning, and I think this is pretty obvious. It's a steep learning curve. We have mature, grown-up, profession, working professionals who studied, if they studied a long time ago, their IT skills might be a little rusty, their e-learning skills might be pretty rusty. What is Moodle? What is Blackboard? What is an LMS? Um, and, then, and then that's all the things they have to learn before they even get into how do I study this, pr this paper content at a distance. Um, and it's, it's quite isolating being a distance student. Uh, we got 80 students, there's none living in the same city together. They only see each other online. Um, we have some synchronous um, Zoom meetings, but you know, a lot of it is happening on those discussion forums. So how do you keep, how do you get people, um, especially that new, that sort of those new students, and I figured out we get about 45, 50% new students every year. And we need that number to keep um, the, class sizes uh, at a useful number. So we're, we're bringing in a whole new and orientating an, uh, half, of our half of our cohort every year. So how do you get those people to understand what it's like to work in, at a, to study at a distance? How do you get them to know what our program is about? How, all of those sorts of things. Um, <clears throat> when going to conferences and talking to people, and I should have the references, but I don't, um, having, having um, this idea of uh, beating these limitations in, in an orientation. So we're getting to this orientation um, solution down here. It needs to be timely. It needs to happen at a time that works for students. And what I find from the 
admin side of a program is those first two weeks of the semester or that month before the paper starts, it's super busy for me. And I don't have time to be doing um, a lot of hand-holding, a lot of helping students na navigate things, which is why we've usually left them to sort of their own devices to kind of struggle through it. And so um, students, um, that period of time is really when they need to be handheld and they need to be taken care of. And so I was feeling like I was not doing them justice for that part of it. Um, and it also needs to be relevant. I'm asking these students to do an orientation, use an orientation tool outside of their paper content. They already have a very limited amount of time for study. Now I'm asking them to do something else. That something else has to link directly to what they're having to do for their paper content because they're not, they don't really want to learn about something new. They want to just get on with learning. And so um, I needed to be very conscious of those two things. So my solution is, is would, in my, when I was devising it, would be something that's an orientation tool that creates connection um, and that is relevant and timely. So, da da <laughs> So this is it. I mean, this is what we've called Embarco Tago, sort of that aviation theme. Um, and um, it is, if no one's familiar with this, this is uh, sort of the way Moodle looks. Um, it's a Moodle paper, synthetic paper, which is what they call them, that sits inside um, Moodle. So students have this as one of the papers that they're taking on their, more, their Moodle dashboard. And it's uh, just a series of little, like, things that you can do, um, and they're all very much tailored to those four, um, those four criteria that I sort of made up for myself. Now, where am I? Um, da -da 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 -da. Yep, good. I'm on, on track, on track. So, um, so one example of that is the post to discussion forum. So everybody uses discussion forum for their distance learning papers. It's pretty standard. But if you've never been on a discussion forum, you've never really used that format, you kind of want a chance to kind of try it out. So this was a, so I had my little instruction as to what they had to do, then there's kind of the button, and then there's, you know, what everybody else is doing. And then once you hit that button, you get to the screen, and then you put in your little um, description. And the discussion, the content of the discussion forum um, I'm sure a lot of people use this. It's sort of like an orientation discussion forum. So say something a little bit about where you are, what you do, what, how you liked your coffee, and where you want a vacation last, that kind of thing. And then it sort of d started this discussion between um, the different students as they responded to each other and sort of um, and built those connections between students within the cohort. So you're doing those two things. Are you, just, you know, you're doing those two things at the same time. You're doing this sort of introduction to discussion forum, but you're also creating connections. And it's relevant. They're going to have to do this the minute they start their content paper. They're going to have to do this exact thing. So it's, um, so, you know, it, it kind of follows along quite seamlessly. Um, and so, oh, da-da-da. <clears throat> so the cool thing about using Moodle and is trying to use up some of their, um, their usage uh, indicators. And so this, 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 the slide over there shows sort of the paper usage. So we opened this paper on February 10th. So papers open 29th of February. We opened this on fe February 10th, so they got a chance to use it before the student, before the actual paper content opened. And so you have a huge number. So we had 80 students in this paper. So 80 divided by, you know, basically 6,000 at one point. Um, that's quite a lot of hits onto, you know, going into the paper, going out, going to the paper. Um, and also I noticed it doesn't drop, so February 29th, which is, somewhere here, um, it doesn't just drop off like that, you know? There's still some amount of use, which I was, I was interested with that because I thought, oh, the minute you get access to your paper content, you're just going to go in there and you're going to find all your resources in there. But no, I found that students keep going back into Embark to kind of um, look at the resources. Maybe um, people would practice submitting an assignment, so they have to submit an assignment online in their paper. They're like, oh, let me practice doing that in the Embark um, setting because it's safe. There's no uh, consequence. I hardly even look at it. Um, and so, so I did find that. And I also find a little bit of a jump at the beginning of the second semester. Um, and then this one shows that, um, you know, there was, there, again, there's, eight, there's only 80 students. And they're hitting, you know, 1,700 divided by 80 is like 20 times. They're going into that step two post in the discussion forum, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and it was obviously our, uh, you know, a uh, uh, fan favorite. I mean, it's just the numbers are way out of control. And, it's, and I think it goes back to it's creating those connections. People are going back in there to kind of hear about their classmates and, um, and sort of talk to each other. So, um, and we did do, um, I'm still in the middle of doing some analysis, but we did do some analysis of the, um, 
of people's use of it. And students' self-reported confidence increased significantly on all four queried indices. So they were asked about how they felt about their IT, confidence in using IT, their confidence in using e-learning, their confidence in using Moodle. And all of those um, were statistically significant um, to a P of less than 0.001. So huge, um, huge differences there. Uh, so a couple of other things to do with the numbers. It was, uh, Embarco Tago was accessed at every minute of the 24-hour clock over the six months that I looked at, uh, for that first six semesters, so there was accessed around the clock. Um, the, high day, the high use day was the 23rd, 24th, which had 1,200 hits. Um, so that's the weekend before, it's really interesting, so it's that weekend before the paper start open, so um, that's obviously when people are starting to think about their paper and getting into study, but they haven't actually had access to the paper yet. Um, the most popular days were 1 a.m., 2 p.m., and 11 p.m., and the average, sort of the mean over the course of the first six months, um, the first semester was about 50 hits a day. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's something. Huh? Um, yeah, so we're still, I'm still working through, I'm st yeah, so that's it. I mean, it's, 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 it was pretty, I don't know, it's just, it's kind of my, my little baby. And, um, and I've been, it, was re it was really fun to sort of develop and um, Sarah and Fiona sort of helped me think about what things I could put in and sort of how we could play with the system. And, um, and I learned a lot about using Moodle, which was quite cool. Um, yeah, I don't know. Does anyone have any questions about that, Sarah? <laughs> Jesse, hang on. I'll oh. bring you the microphone. Sure. Yeah, you have to use it for the... Just wondering if this could be, do you see this as something that could be adapted for other distance? Great question. So that was where I was going. Thank you, Fiona. Um, no, the idea was that this was like a, a little pilot to kind of see how it would go with my students and that um, I'm very open to um, sharing the specifics, but also kind of just kind of the philosophy behind um, setting up something like this. And um, I've, been, I've been in discussions with... Um, distance learning about putting, opening it up to all distance papers and having a Blackboard version and a Moodle version because, as you know, if you're not in health sciences, you're using Blackboard. Um, and then um, I'm having discussions with academic services about possibly doing a, a version for the first year um, intake as well. I mean, a different version, but the same idea where you'd have an orientation to the LMS in, within the LMS, um, which I think is, is really a key part of um, this, this package that we put together. So, yeah, so it's definitely, yeah, I was going to try and take all your emails down and, and send it to you, but um, it's pretty easy. I can get you in to see it, and you can just kind of download the whole thing and stick it over, so it's pretty straightforward. Um, oh, so, well, well, okay, so, sorry, before we get into other questions, so some of the really interesting things that I'm sort of in my further exploration stage is that when you break down the stats over old students and new students, the new students' numbers are, you know, the, they're very significant. Whereas, you know, old students, and this is what you kind of find with orientation. The, the feedback I got was um, one guy wrote me and said, you know, I'm happy to do your survey, but this is my eighth paper, and I don't really need an orientation. And I'm like, you're right, you don't. You're not the reason we're doing this. And that shows, you know, there, there's definitely students, the, the new students are definitely where the focus as far as um, getting them up to speed and getting them comfortable with um, the technology is. And, um, and we did, I... I the way I did the survey was a little confusing and I'm having trouble sort of pulling out data in a useful um, way, but I really wanted to look at how students feel connected. And, um, and so these answers were the ones that got um, over 75% of students chose these as the, the modes that they like to communicate in. And as you can see, they're not actually ones that we do in Embark. I mean, I'm not uh, sending tutors emails into Embark or anything like that. But it does show how important Zoom meetings are. And these are our synchronous meetings that we have um, via Zoom. And I think that just shows that um, that time is really important. And this, and this is my, my new um, goal, is there was nothing that made out of the questions. You know, I, I posed the questions. Do you feel connected to the university via da, 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 da? None of them got uh, a mark above to the 75%. Um, everybody feels this is the way they're connected to the university. 
I'm hoping that doesn't mean they don't feel connected to the university. I think that's probably the way I ask the question. But I definitely think it's a focus point for me to kind of make students feel connected to the program and connected to the university wherever they are around the world. Yeah? Often, um, for example, in the um, graduate opinion surveys, those, those bigger surveys that are done, um, that's the one about connection to the university and feeling part of the university that distance students give low scores to. They'll feel very, very connected to the department and to lecturers and people that they have that direct contact with, but the bigger institution is too big and they're, yeah. yeah. So, uh, no wonder. Yeah, <laughs> and that was what I was really interested when you were talking about the, was it theology, theology department? They actually mentioned, I really feel connected to the University of Otago, and I was like, whoa, yeah. how did you do it? Um, so that was very interesting. And, um, and just total side note, and I have no idea what I'm gonna do with this, but um, my background is in cross-cultural uh, cross education, and. Um, and sort of that idea of, you know, that world. And I found this really interesting. So we have 20 students who pay domestic fees and 12 that pay international fees. But when they self-identify, only 12 identify as New Zealand European and 20 self-identify as, you know, whatever other ethnicities. And that was, that was you know, across the gamut of the international students and the, dom and the domestic students. So I thought that was, that was interesting because I'm always sort of curious about that kind of how that breaks down differently. Um, yeah, so. Does anybody thanks. else have a comment or question for Kelly? Ah. <laughs> Paul, and then Elaine, was it? Over to Paul first. Just a little more detail about the. Yeah. This will be available to the rest of us. <laughs> uh, and he says Oh, he well, it, it all comes down to, I was going to say manpower, am I supposed to say person power or something? Because yes, the distance learning office, I, I, we feel that it's our responsibility to, to learn from Kelly's experience here and steal Kelly's idea, ideas and, and make them available for you. Now, we, we acknowledge the fact that the orientation type activities that you provide in your programs are very personalised. You do go through that process of, you know, inducting your students and whatnot. But having a central resource that you can tap into and make, and make your own, I think that would be, from talking around with people, I think that might be a useful thing. Not to, not to go the way of having the one big orientation program that's the same thing that everybody does, um, but having s some kit, a kit, that, you know, like you have little tools that you can pull down, but it's got that sort of, a, a, a place where you can get that central information um, that then you can make use of, modify if you want to, um, and have something to start with at least. So yes, we're going to do that. And uh, Kelly's trying to find a little bit of money to do it. And yeah, we're, we're, we're going knowing, all the various We methods. are making a commitment to doing something about it next year. Yeah how quick it'll happen, hopefully across next year we'll get something going. Um, and, you know, the encouragement from... <laughs> okay, okay, so this is encourages Fiona, you haven't got enough to do, do it. <laughs> anyway, yes, we'll, we will definitely do something about that. And because so, so many people are using Moodle, we, we need to make it suitable so that, so that it's... Uh, accessible or able to be used in both those platforms. Um, yes, but we always need people to be sort of the guinea pigs and you all are, are, are guinea pigs for this uh, little project. So um, yeah, it's actually, it, I, think, I think for a lot of, for, I mean, I've been working in this distance education stuff for six years, which isn't that long, but I feel like so, there's been such a jump in the last year at Otago as far as distance learning. But I think this is very much more possible now. Um, and back to that, that point I made about the timeliness of it. Um, the cool thing about this was I set this up, I, I spent the energy of this at a time that was sort of slower. It wasn't the main enrollment admission period. And then I just flicked a switch and it started. And I didn't even look at it again until um, March, April, and I was like, oh, I wonder what's been happening in there. And so um, it, that was very useful to me because it meant that I had a resource for students that they could be um, upskilling themselves in this area without me having to actually do anything at that time, which was really, um, which was one of the things that I thought was really useful about it. 
So which means you need to start right now. You need to just build one of these now for your program because now is when it's a good time to do it. <laughs> Not in January and February. But um, Yes, Carol. Thanks very much. Kelly, just yes. a quick question. All right. What's FIB? What's what? Spot the FIB. Ah, so this is great. Um, uh, when I did this session for the general staff conference, uh, we actually went through and, um, and I have, this is the actual username and password for getting in. There's six, there's eight accounts, temp A, B, C, D, E, G, F, G, H. So um, don't everybody go into temp A because then you'll all have answered this fib. But it was um, my attempt at making students feel connected to the university. So it was a, you practice using a quiz because that's something that you're going to do in a distance paper. And the quiz was, which, um, you know, which of these is a fib? And it said, what did it say, Fiona? It said, um, you know, I lived in Mor I lived in a Moroccan harem, and I uh, did a distance. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, you need the. So Fiona was one of our spot the fibs, our one of our two truths and a lie. So the the deal was that we had to make a video, a short video, and we had three statements that we made about ourselves, and it was really just about engaging students and getting them used to faces that they might see in their courses. So I had three questions. I'm the second youngest of 15 children. I lived in Morocco um, where the man who I was employed by had a harem of five young women all under the age of 25. And I can't remember the other one, but um, the true question, uh, oh. You were distant, you took a distance. Oh, that I did a distance learning master of information, uh, library and information studies through Victoria. So that was true. And the fact that I lived in Morocco in that situation was true. I wasn't part of the harem, I was too old. <laughs> and um, so the fib was that I'm actually the second youngest of 10 children, not 15. So it was just a useful way. I know, it's not much different. But it's a useful way for people to be aware of using videos online if they haven't done that before. And as you say, the quizzes, and it was just fun. And you also talked about the distance learning office. I, uh, I talked about the distance learning office and if people get stuck and they're not sure who to go to because they're just absolutely at their wits end then they can always contact me and I can find the right person that they need to talk to. So it was quite fun. Yeah. Killing a few birds in one stuff. Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's definitely, oh sorry, yeah. It was definitely like an icebreaker um, for the different people within the program. So we had, uh, so this, this time around we had Sarah and Fiona and we had Jeff Ormandy because I thought he might be coming in for Zoom. Um, support, um, but as it you know, if it grow, if when it grows, um, you know, we might have different people from your program, also from the university at large, um, be doing those sorts of sort of fun, sort of informal ways of connecting with students. So, but it was very much to do with your program as well. So you had those generic things about the bigger <coughs> university services support, whatever, but it had that component where you had your students introducing themselves to each other, you know, it, it, to that cohort. It wasn't all students everywhere. So, it, so I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm saying that's a positive. You yeah. were able to, to have kind of both foot, well, both, a foot in both camps, the bigger university camp and the confines of your department and your program. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So you can see here, this, it was the second most popular activity after that ridiculous spot the feed. So um, yeah, and if people want to come, I can show <laughs> I can show them the videos. It's very cute. <laughs> so yeah, big thanks to distance learning because um, although Sarah and Fiona, you know, did, um, were on a different campus and all those things, they were very supportive of when I had this idea and when I was sort of it was bubbling around in my head and sort of gave me that sort of cheerleading support which I think they could give all of us and I think we should all give each other about trying new things and um, and just getting out there and making an attempt at it because um, because I think that's what it is you know you kind of try and we all know that you try something it sort of works and then you try it you know you just build on it so that's that's good good on you Kelly good. thank you for sharing yeah. that with Thanks. us <laughs> <clears throat>